Call the meeting to order. Could you have attendance, please? Sure. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Lindstrom? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Mr. Bennett? Here. Ms. Giftos. Here. Please join me in Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Any adjustments to the agenda? I do have one down on 10.4. Uh, the minutes, we need a little more time, so we'd like to put that off until November 19th, and that's 10.4. Any other adjustments? If not, we'll continue on. At this point in time, um, I just would like to acknowledge Gabby Giftis, who is a junior at Scarborough High School, and she's going to be on the board here as a student rep. So congratulations to you, Gabby. We're really looking forward to having your voice at the table. Thank you. I'm very excited for this opportunity. And our newest board member, Shannon Lindstrom, congratulations to you. We look forward to working with you on our team, and we know you'll do an outstanding job. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with everybody as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. Election of board officers. Any nominations for the board chair? Yeah. I'd like to nominate April Scyther. Do I have a second? Second. 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 Thank you. Any other nominations? Seeing none, Dr. Nato, could we have a roll call? Sure. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes, congratulations. And Ms. Giftos? Yes. Thank you all very much. I'll pass that to you. 
Oh boy. <laughs> <That's> exciting. <laughs> It's all yours. Moving on, agenda item 5.2, uh, selection of a school board vice chair. Do I have a nomination? Kristen. I would like to nominate Leanne Kozolonis. Second. Is there any other nominations? Um, no, but I, I do want to say something really quickly if I can. I don't know if I, we didn't have a discussion in the last one, so I didn't know if this was the time to say it or I should wait for the vote. Uh, no, we should discuss before we vote. Okay. Um, so I just have a few concerns. Um, to be completely transparent and honest, initially I'd considered running for vice chair myself, um, something I've talked about in the past with many of you, including our new chair. Um, but after more consideration, I, I decided not to, uh, and primarily for two reasons. Um, the first, um, is that I came to realize that I didn't have the support in this body to win. Um, the second, and, and more importantly, I like April and Sarah and entering my final year on the board, and I may or not be here in 12 months' time. When I took office back in 2018, there were five of us who were brand new to this board, and two senior board members that just had one year of experience under their belts that were the senior people in the room. Um, I served as vice chair that first year, and I saw how challenging it was um, for our chair, for Leanne, to get up to speed with, with no one else on the board to look to for experiential device, advice. Excuse me. Um, but she did it, and she did it with grace and humility, and I know it wasn't easy. So my concern for vice chair is less about the person that's been nominated and more about the future. I would love to see and I would urge one of our newer board members to nominate, or to, to nominate for this role. Um, to put a succession plan in place and diversify our senior leadership body on this board. If no one else wants to, I understand. And no matter how the vote goes tonight or how I vote tonight, please know that I will always rise up to serve this board, our schools and our community to the best of my abilities so long as I hold this office. Thank you. Any other discussion? Diane, could I have a roll call please? Sure. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? No. Ms. Catalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes, congratulations. And Ms. Giftos? Yes. Excellent, congratulations, Leanne. Thank I look you. forward to continuing to work with you as my vice chair. Thank you. Agenda item six. Thanks, point ladies, for stepping up. <laughs> You're welcome, Sarah. Thank you for saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> agenda item 6.0, public comment on agenda items. Check me. Seeing no public comment, agenda item 7.0, superintendent's report. Thank you. I'd like to uh, speak about the November enrollment. We typically do this every month, and uh, we'll just pull that screen up there, and then we'll get started. I'm gonna go from uh, the top left-hand corner, starting at the high school, and just go to the right with the numbers. Um, at the high school, currently, we have 948 students. A year ago at this time, we had 987. We currently have three homeschool, 112 remote, 100% 100 remote, and 836 students are hybrid. At the middle school, we currently have 707. We, a year ago, had 696 homeschool currently, 17 students, 100% remote, 115, and hybrid. 592. At Wentworth, currently 610 students. A year ago, we had 667. Homeschool at Wentworth is 16. 100% remote is 78 students. And with hybrid, we're at 532. At Blue Point, we have 197 students now. A year ago, we had 203. And again, if you look at all three elementary schools, we have 33 students K through 
two who are being homeschooled. And again, back to Blue Point, 100% remote. We have 38 students. And with hybrid, we have 159. Eight corners, we currently have 226 students. Last year, we had 240. I'm going to skip over the homeschool, because I mentioned that earlier. 100% remote, 54 students. And hybrid, 172. And Pleasant Hill, we have 184 students currently. Last year we had 204. We have 100% remote of 37 students at Pleasant Hill and hybrid 147. So if you look down at the left-hand corner, total kiddos now is 2,872. A year ago, 2,997. Again, homeschool total 69, 100% remote total of all our students 434, and our hybrid we have 2,438. If you look at our total enrollment from this year to last year, we're down 25 students at this point in time. If I could go on, if that's okay. I'd like to talk about snow days, if that's, get that slide up there. And, um, so we have an LD law 2167, just as a reminder to the public that um, snow days, school days, for whatever reason, uh, they're waived until January 15th, 2021. People are wondering if that may be an extension into the second half of the year, and it's possible, but we have not had a word on that yet. Uh, Maine DOE has required a number of days for the rest of the year, and again, um, until then, snow days, again, do not have to be made up. I have a recommendation. Um, been very concerned all fall about the worry if we have a storm, whether it's a windstorm or a snowstorm, that we're relying on people to work out of their homes on computers. And just this week, we had an outage in Scarborough. And so when I think about snowstorms, when you get you know four or five inches, I worry about one part of the town may not have electricity. The other part of the town may have electricity. And the equity issue of providing education for all students that day could be a challenge. In addition to that, I think about our staff members. Again, we're about students, but also we have staff members that work out of this district. Some travel 45 minutes to an hour to work. And I worry that if, if they're at home and they can't get to work or they can't work remote in their own town because their own town might not have electricity, that it could be um, kind of a mess early morning to try to patch this up and keep the calmness with everybody. So my recommendation is that I would suggest we just a snow day is a snow day. Let the students go out and play. Make it a typical storm day so that we just don't get in any confusion about who has electricity and who does not. I think you're lucky in Scarborough, for the most part, you don't have a ton of snow days, typically. You may, I'm guessing, three to four a year. Um, so I'm hopeful that, first of all, this can be done well. And um, my, my hope is that the students and the staff, this could be a, a, a true snow day where you can um, do the fun things that you typically have done on a snow day. So that's my recommendation. And uh, I'll be happy to further talk about that. Or if you have questions now, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. I, I also, Sarah's been instrumental over the, my time here, just working with her department to, to make a determination about snow days. And um, again, I've consulted with her on this. She's behind it. I know Diane is as well. So. It really, hopefully, we just want to keep people in a good place, right? So at this point in time, um, I have to say, Sarah, 
you have done an outstanding job with your staff this year. Just the discussions that I heard today and what she and her team has done has been amazing. So I, I think it'd be a wonderful opportunity if there's something that you want to say. I'm not sure people really understand all the little things that you had to do this year about making this, the buses safe and, and really making sure that um, our children have the best interests of, of our bus drivers, which they do. Yeah, that'd yep. be great. I think that's a great segue, Sarah. Are we moving on to the transportation update? Or would you like to make comments about snow days? Yeah, I would sure. I'm sorry. No, I was that's okay. We have a discussion about the snow days. Sure. Yeah. If we could. Um, so it's funny because historically I've been concerned about going remotely for snow days because I think that my concern has been um, about a diminished expectation for teaching and learning remotely. I, I might pre-pandemic um, when that was suggested. And so um, to now be concerned that, about not having studies <laughs> is kind of ironic. <laughs> but I don't know what that says. But, um, but, but I just worry that in the time of the pandemic, I feel like the instructional time is critical um, because, you know, I think we're attempting to maximize every day that we can and, and we're, you know, we're not necessarily operating as functionally as we have been. So um, that that is a concern for me, and I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I thought about that too, to be honest with you, and I think it's, it's, it's a balance with all of this because obviously um, the students are not in school as much as they typically have been in the past. At the same time, I just, I, I can't imagine at 6 a.m. in the morning trying to manage how one class or one part of the town would have electricity and the other town may not. Particularly what I've read about outages in the Northeast, it's just been climbing and climbing every year. And so it's probably not unlike us this year to have some outages. I could be wrong, mm -hmm. I could be wrong on that. But I, I, I think there's a balance here and I hear the concern, you know. Um, but I, at the same time, people are really working hard, and, and I think it, I just put my own self in that place at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., thinking I've got to teach a class, but I don't have any electricity. What am I going to do? do? Do you have, Sandy, any information about outages historically from snow days? Do we know the data of if? I don't have that. Okay. I don't have that. I, I did read up on the Northeast, though. I mean, it's really on the increase percentage-wise, the number of outages that they've seen in the last 10 years. So, um, again, it, it, we may not have any outages, but I'm just trying to be a little proactive with this. I mean, Sarah? I understand. Oh, I recognize that. They're all valid concerns. Then my, I guess my last question is to you, April. Um, it, he's giving us a recommendation. Is this something we're voting on or? So it's a non-action item for tonight. If the board, mm -hmm. if that's something that the board wanted to vote on, we would need to put it on our future agenda for as an action item. Um, in, that we're in uncharted territory here in that it's always been the superintendent's discretion to call snow days. And so if Sandy were to call a snow day, defining what that snow day looks like, um, We've never we've never had that discussion, um, and and who's ultimately whose decision that is. So I think that the board should ultimately vote on that. Um, is is my opinion? Okay. Um, and I'd like to hear the a, a discussion about it if we could put it back on the agenda, um, and give the public an opportunity to. Um, comment and, and participate in that discussion, I would feel really good about it. I mean, I, I see the validity in your recommendation, um, okay. but people may have different opinions. I can take that under advisement. Sarah, did you want to say a comment? I was going to ask the same question that Alicia just ended with, just around what our action is here. And then I think I agree with putting it as an action item for an upcoming meeting. What I would um, ask from you, Sandy, is in addition to just collecting some more data on outages, 
is just to get some feedback from teachers and, and staff on what they think about the recommendation. Um, and then the only other thing I would ask you to consider is, is whether it's something that we actually have to make a decision on now or, or, or if it's something that we can say, uh, you know, sometimes when we call a snow day, it's not really even that bad of a storm. We just know maybe it's going to be really heavy in the morning during the, the bus route and, and commuting. So there could be no outages, right? And then other times maybe it's really bad and there's a ton of outages. So maybe we just add that as a, variab a variable into considering whether or not it's a full snow day or kind of a, a, a remote school day for everyone. Um, and, and, and in which case we wouldn't really need to make this decision. We would just need to define the criteria for, for calling what type of snow day it is, I guess. I think um, this is certainly, the board has expressed an interest in, in bringing this topic up again. Um, I think it's good to give the um, community advance notice that it will be an action item if there are people who would like to speak to um, it on a future agenda. And so for now, I will, I will mark it down as something we would like to discuss more. Okay. Sarah, would you like to take the podium? Sure. Thank you. So I am Sarah Redmond. I'm the director of transportation here in the town of Scarborough. And I would like to say, Sandy's right, I have a great team of bus drivers. We've stepped up. They've done the impossible, which we thought was going to be impossible until school started, all unaware of how things were going to go. So this is what my team is doing. Every bus has been equipped with a hand sanitizer. As students get on, they hand sanitize. We make sure they have masks. They sit in their assigned seat. We get to school, they get off, they again re-sanitize their hands. My drivers have been doing their routes. Every driver this year has technically four different routes. Cohort A, high school, middle school. Cohort A, K-5, and the same for cohort B. We've kept track of all the students and where they're sitting on the buses as required. They sanitize their buses in between the runs. At the end of the morning runs, all buses are again wiped down. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're vacuumed. We go out and we do our afternoon runs. Again, the same goes into play. The kids hand sanitize. They have their assigned seats. And they sit down and they're taken home. Difference at the end of the day, buses are vacuumed. But we have staff that have been trained to use the electromagnetic machines so every day from 4 30 to 6 30 all of our buses are sanitized equally it's probably a little over the top but i'd rather be safe than sorry drivers have extra boxes of masks in their in their buses they have gloves anything a student may need there's been a couple of occasions where kids just forgot their masks they're running late and instead of having to say to somebody, I'm sorry, we can't transport you, we hand them a mask and we can bring them to school. So they have, they've stepped up. During the day, we have a lot of um, no field trips, but the drivers are doing a ton of work transporting all of the students' needs, whether they have to come to school for an hour here, an hour and a half there. They come in late, they go home early, and they do it. No questions asked. It's just this repetitive. None of us knew what was going to happen. But I, I will say this has been a really strong, good year for all of us. Bus runs have been combined. We don't have the full staff that we need at no one's fault. They've been combined. Parents have been amazing. We've taken their kids. Amazing when we call them to say, hey, sorry, but we have to change your child's bus route. Here's the time. We've avoided doing robocalls, myself, and I have a part-time secretary that works for me, Lisa, and we call the parents ourselves. It, it just seems more personal. The parents seem to appreciate it more. You know, we've added kids every day. We're adding kids now. We're only transporting about 30% of all the kids that are enrolled in Scarborough, <laughs> which is keeping our buses safer. Kids are spread apart. We have a couple bus runs that are almost at capacity, which is 28 students 
but a majority of them aren't. So when parents call, we ask them to give us about a week. We put them on a waiting list. That's what we're calling it, a waiting list, so that we can get them in our system, get them in our list, get them on the right bus, assign them a seat, and make sure we have them going to school the right days. So I, I do have to say, my staff has been amazing. And I'm glad, with not knowing what was gonna happen at the beginning of the year, they've done great. So that would be my update. Thank you. Can I just say it's really amazing that, that you put that together in such a short amount of time and been able to do all of that work and set up the cleaning schedule and the change of schedules. I mean, that's really remarkable. And I haven't heard any negative feedback in the community and um, people have really stepped up and, and people seem happy. So that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so as a reminder, I've heard wonderful things about this community Thanksgiving dinner and you're going on to your fifth annual dinner this year. And so, as you can see in the slide, this year will be just a little different. You can order online, and there is an opportunity to call that number up there. And certainly, the deadline to order your dinner is November 20th. And again, it's going to be a curbside pickup, which is Wednesday, November 25th. The meal is at no cost. It will be delicious. <laughs> It's hosted by the Scarborough School Nutrition Program and the Scarborough Community Services Project Grace. So I know this is a big event in Scarborough. I know people have thoroughly enjoyed this. If you've not had the opportunity to uh, attend this or at least pick up the food this year, please do so. And uh, it's, a, it's a tradition and uh, I just wanted to mention that as a reminder. I'm sure many of you have been to it. And uh, it's that time of year where we've got to start planning for it. Thank you. OK. We're now on to agenda item 7.5. Um, I believe that Monique uh, had wanted to say a few words um, before we take this off as our agenda item. So welcome, Monique. Thank you. I um, asked Sandy if I could um, make a statement. Black Lives Matter. This is a human rights and civil rights statement, not a statement that falls under our controversial issues policy. And by stating otherwise, I made a mistake. The intent of the communication aside, its impact caused significant pain to many, in particular, our students of color. I sincerely apologize for the pain it caused. I am committed to continuing to learn how to be anti-racist. It is my hope that my actions going forward will help in healing the damage done. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. I could follow up on that? Yes, please, Sandy. Um, I would like to be clear to everyone, the board, students, and our community, that on behalf of my entire administrative team, we firmly believe that black lives matter. This is not a controversial issue. It is a fact that black lives matter. <clears throat> As the past couple of weeks have shown us, we have a lot of work to do, and we are committed to doing that work that needs to be done. But before we start the conversation, I just want to repeat that black lives matter. Thank you both very much. Agenda item 
determine a workshop date on drafting a resolution ensuring Scarborough Public Schools provides a safe and inclusive environment for students and staff. And I believe that Diane has um, begun the legwork on this and will be um, updating the board as to the status of her work. Sure, thank you. So um, I wanted to update the board about some possibilities um, that are that we have been exploring and that we'd like to get some guidance from the board on. Um, and also, um, I can talk about some other steps that we have actively been taking already. But I, we had the opportunity on Friday afternoon to have a um, online meeting with the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. Um, and they're based out of Maryland. Um, they are a nonprofit organization that is largely funded by the Department of Education. You may wonder how I decided to reach out to that particular group. Um, they have been very active in helping schools. Um, in fact, uh, they work with many school districts across the state of Maine. Um, Notably, the Portland Public School System, which um, if any of you are familiar with the diversity and equity work that has happened in Portland over the past several years, it's very rich. Um, and um, this particular group has guided that work for Portland. Um, in our initial conversation with the consultant there, um, our purpose was really to just gather some information to find out about what possibilities might exist, what services that we might be able to tap into with them, uh, because it's very important that we reach out to experts in this field to help us um, and to guide us through this work. And so there are definitely a lot of possibilities for us. Um, and I'll just kind of list what some of those are for you. Um, they have the ability to um, guide us through a community forum um, or a town hall type of meeting. Um, they have run focus groups and listening tours in districts that they work with. They have a climate survey that uh, they've used widely with school districts. And those are really important foundational pieces that they see as being really critical data points from which um, they could help us to craft an action plan. Um, I also was really impressed uh, because one of the first things the consultants asked was, uh, do you have groups in your community that are already actively engaged in this work. And I said, our civil rights team at the high school, certainly, um, and the anti-racist coalition that began this summer. And they said, we, they wanted to just be really clear that we don't come into a community to um, overlook the work that's been done, but they really uh, try to say, how do we bring those people actively to the table so that we recognize the efforts that have been made and really listen to those voices. Um, and so I was really impressed by that. Um, in addition to the work that I've already described, they also have other uh, possible venues for us, such as um, they can conduct a policy review so they can look at our board policies to, from that equity lens. Um, they have the ability uh, for us to enter into a contract with them to do a curriculum review. Um, and, um, and can also provide much of the professional development that we might outline um, in terms of part of the work. Uh, Carmen, the person that, I, that we spoke to was really clear that um, this is a big undertaking. Uh, when districts uh, engage in this work and that, you know, clearly this would not be a short-term relationship or, uh, you know, a small initiative, but we would be outlining steps that we could take over a 
you know, the long term so that we can build capacity. Um, and so I was really impressed by her. Uh, I, I did reach right back out to her on Monday and said, um, is there the opportunity for us to connect um, with the school board, with our school board, so that they could hear more directly about um, what possibilities exist? Because I think it's really important for us to um, do the board's work, right, in the will of the board, and then to move from that. And um, today, they um, actually uh, assigned us to uh, a specific consultant who would be doing the work um, because Carmen, um, the person that we spoke with, already is working with a number of school districts. And so she wanted to be really responsive in the short term and let us know about um, what services they could offer. But she was really clear in saying, um, you know, at our next meeting, as we talk about the, you know, districts that are contacting us, um, your district would be assigned a representative. And so um, I, I heard from that individual just this afternoon, in fact, um, and she's offered up a few times. Um, what she would like to do is to have an intake meeting um, uh, in the next few days, uh, basically an hour meeting for us to just talk about what some potential next steps would be. So I haven't, um, I haven't confirmed one of those dates with her because my question to the board this evening was, um, would there be interest in um, a representative from the board um, to be part of that meeting so that um, you know we could really engage collaboratively in that planning. So that was super exciting. Um, some other updates. As many of you know, we've had about 40 staff members who have been engaged in some work with um, MSMA in the Cultural Competency Institute. Uh, many of you board members were um, part of the MSMA conference um, this past Friday and Saturday. And, and if you were, you heard a lot about cultural, the Cultural Competency Institute. And I reached out to you last week to see if there was board interest um, in joining in on some of that work. And so I know, um, you know, Kelly and I have been working to make sure that we could, even though um, it's a series of 10 workshops and two oh. have already happened, um, we are able to add um, at this time. And so I'm really encouraged by the board being part of that learning with us. So I think that will be a, a great next step. And then um, one other piece, we had signed on um, this summer the University of Southern Maine had asked us if we wanted to partner with about nine or 10 other districts um, in uh, the Southern Maine area who, to really examine equity and um, to, to be a think tank and share some of our processes and, and make some uh, developments in a similar direction. And um, that work, interestingly enough, is also being um, done by the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, um, and so it just so happened that our that USM had planned the kickoff meeting for this past Monday, and um, so Sandy and Monique and I joined that meeting and were able to, um, you know, meet the other districts that are participating in the work and hear about uh, where everyone is on their journey and the work that's happening. And so I'm really. Uh, pos thinking positively about um, what those linkages have to offer us as well. Thank you very much, Diane. So sure. what we need to do now, um, I think as a board, is center this conversation around what is our next most logical um, step moving forward. Um, I can't say thank you enough, Diane, for doing the legwork to prepare for us to have this valuable conversation. From my perspective, um, I certainly think that, you know, we need a um, experienced facilitator to help us um, navigate these, this topic, even to just learn how to talk about this topic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I certainly am interested um, 
you know, in meeting with the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. Um, I don't know what that looks like, and I'm gonna turn to my fellow board members to decide if we want to do an intake meeting and send a representative, or whether we want to do that more as a whole board and invite them to come. Um, I think we have some options. So, so um, <clears throat> if, I, if I understand correctly, we would be doing the intake in order to choose a facilitator for the workshop. I think if we did the intake, they would be asking us what our needs are, what we're looking to get from them, what a partnership with them would mean to us before they came. Yes, that's correct. You know, so the purpose of this intake meeting that um, we're being asked about is for our, the person who specifically be, has been assigned to us, if we're interested in continuing with the relationship, of course, to really understand what our needs are and um, to help strategize what is the best effective rollout um, in terms of, you know, the things that, we may be interested in, and then how do we make sure that we set forth in the right direction from the start um, so that we can really be thoughtful about the way in which uh, this is developed. So, so have we already chosen them as the facilitator, and it's not necessarily an interview for them, it's more of a goal setting meeting? I'm just trying to figure out if, if we've already met that hurdle and not or not in terms of that's who we're going to use. So we certainly didn't enter into an agreement with them. The purpose of our meeting was to collect information about what potentials exist and to bring that back to the board so that the board could decide that. Um, you know, certainly we didn't shop around um, to look at who are some other folks that could do this for us. And that was really... Um, uh, there were a couple of reasons behind that. One is they have come so highly recommended and we've seen firsthand um, in some community districts what that work looks like. And so they are very strong and reputable. And I also understand the timeliness mm -hmm. of wanting to move forward with the work. That was, that was part of the rationale for my question. I guess the only concern I would have about them is not knowing who funds them. I would love to know that answer um, because sometimes that can reveal sort of their own ideology or, or what, what they're trying to do. Do you know that? Well, again, as I said, most of their work is underwritten by the Department of Education. And so you could go to their website and explore that in greater detail. Um, it's maec.org. Um, and again, we didn't talk in our meeting about a financial commitment. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, she did just touch upon that if this was uh, a relationship that the board was interested in pursuing, we would be entering into like a memorandum of agreement. So that would solidify our interest. Um, but they understood that uh, in our conversation that we were really conversing with them at this point for information only. Thank you, Diane. Other comments? Sarah? Um, I think, uh, so, so my thoughts are that we should, you know, move forward and at least have the intake meeting with them and, and share with them what you know, our goals are and our needs and see what they come back with in, in terms of the proposal. Um, I was like quickly trying to do some research on them on my phone, um, but appreciate that those that you guys there might not have the same opportunity to do that. So um, I agree with Alicia, I would like to do a little bit more background um, on sort of who they are, where their funding comes from. Um, Dan, you mentioned who would be the person that would be assigned to us? What was their name? Um, her name is Michelle Nutter. And again, um, as we talked with Carmen, our um, 
the person that we talked to on Friday as 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 we kind of laid out where we were and, and what we were looking for in general terms. Um, what Carmen had shared was in general, um, they certainly understand that school boards like to meet with folks before they enter in um, to um, a, really, a, a more long-term relationship. And so as such, um, they said in general, you know, she said, I don't want to commit a consultant's time, um, but um, you know the the expected timeline would be that it it may be possible in the next three weeks or so for us to set up a time that um, Michelle could speak with the full board at a meeting um, to to just be really transparent about what they have to offer, et cetera. Um, and you know we are in the month of November already and so um, in thinking about when a forum might happen or listening tours or something to that effect to really start digging into feedback with the community um, in, in terms of their timeline, uh, Carmen was saying that she could see that happening around the first of the year um, and, and the reality is we are in mid-November um, and we have a couple of holidays and um, some time off that is upcoming. So I understand that uh, January does seem a far ways off, but at the same time, um, I, I think that it uh, would behoove us to make sure that, that we have um, the right direction and leadership for this work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I guess the only other thing I would say is, um, you know, one of the big takeaways from the last couple, last week or so for me was that this is, you know, this is a community uh, problem, and I think the community is is wants to be involved in the solution as well. Um, and so I would, I would advise. It's important to me that there's other members than just the school board and administration who are involved in that intake um, and basically deciding what our goals are and, and what our needs are because I can tell you what I think um, but I think Max would probably have a different perspective um, or some other people you know teachers or uh, members of the civil rights team so I think I don't know that all of those people uh, logistically need to be on that call but I do think it's critical that we get um, a wide group of, of feedback before we have that conversation with them as to what our needs are. So I concur. <laughs> so what I'm hearing people say is, you know, we, we know we, we don't want to delay on beginning this work. Um, you know, we, we understand its importance and we are making it a priority to, to begin this process. Where I'm kind of at a loss um, is how to get to this first step even, that we really, you know, we really want to get to a place where we can have meaningful workshop, where we can bring in a facilitator. But what I'm hearing people say is we don't know what services we would even necessarily want yet because we haven't spoken with community members or we haven't spoken with students or we haven't spoken with um, activist clubs and things like that. So, you know, from, from my perspective, do we have a less do we have a less formal workshop time that is centered around our board and, and our community? And I don't know who would facilitate or what you got, you know, how we want this to go, but I feel like we, we have some data collecting to do before we jump to setting a workshop. And so I'm not sure quite how to get to that that first workshop. Alicia. What if we just set a workshop, invite them to come, invite um, our community partners to come and we can talk to them and, and, and sort of ask our questions. The community can ask their questions and then if that seems like the right fit, then we can try to set the date for January for the real work to start. But I guess the problem would be if they're not the right fit. But, um, it, you know, they, they sound like, on paper, they sound like a great... It, it, um, facilitator so is that something that you think they would be interested or able to do Diane 
come and have that initial meet with us, but not have it be, but have it be, you know, in a public, in a public. Yeah, meeting. I think from the conversation that we had, and again, you know, Sandy or Monique weigh in because they were on the call um, with me as well. Um, my take from that conversation on Friday was that they understood that, um, you know, getting that support or getting a board behind their work was a critical first step and one that, um, you know, that they would be willing to enter into. Um, so my recommendation is that we ask um, Diane to be in touch with them to set up a workshop time. And we need to be cognizant of people's schedules also. I know, I know we're all eager to do the work, but we also need to think about how we're going to communicate this to the public, how we're going to gather engagement around this, how we're going to make sure that people um, who would like to have a voice in this conversation are heard. It's also a global pandemic, and so I'm anticipating that this is going to have to be over Zoom. Um, and so that is another obstacle to how to facilitate this and what exactly that looks like. Um, but I certainly would be in favor of us moving forward with this initial meeting um, and bringing as many people to the table as would like to be there um, to dis and then kind of regroup and come back as a board and decide whether this is the direction that we would like to take. Other thoughts? Kristen? Thank, thank you. I, I... Yeah, when yeah. you say... Go ahead, Kristen. Um, Bring as many voices to the table that want to be there. Does that mean we're going to open this initial meeting to a full workshop with anyone in the community who wants to participate? Is that what you're thinking? I think I'm thinking that we would send targeted invites to people who have already expressed interest to make sure that they had representation there. And then because all of our meetings are public meetings, anyone from the public would be welcome to attend and, and to listen. But not participate. Uh, it would depend on how we chose to facilitate that. We could certainly make it so that we could take, we could have a public comment portion, um, you know, midway through or at the end as opposed to at the beginning, um, if that increased engagement. Just so I just as a point of clarity for myself as I, um, you know, set forth after this evening, um, as, as we're talking about this initial meeting, it would be basically for us to hear more about the services that they can provide, not for them to just walk in here blind to a community forum, correct? Absolutely. I okay. was definitely thinking of it as <laughs> as a as a presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Sorry, Sarah. It, yeah, no, I guess my understanding was that, that there would be maybe a second part of that though. It's it's uh, part one, here's what we could provide, here are our services, and then Part two is either in that forum or in a separate forum, we figure out as a community what our goals are, how we want to actually utilize them as, as a service. So that was what I was sort of suggesting that we needed a, a broader voice and input from. And, and maybe, Diane, the conversation from them is, um, what's another way that we can go about getting that, that type of input? without because because I hear the the concern April or, or the worry um, that you stated which I share which is if we open this up to a workshop and a town hall type event without a trained facilitator it could quickly devolve into something that we don't want um, and so I do want to make sure that we have that in place uh, but I also don't necessarily think there's that much value in them coming in and presenting to the community what their services are unless there's like an immediate action for us then to follow up and say great here's what we would want from you um, especially given how much time like we have to have between meetings max um i completely agree with sarah i think um 
going off a little bit. I think that um, if we're going to seek out this, um, like a mediator or a moderator, like the group that we're talking about, um, we might need to figure out like a more targeted course of action in terms of what we think our districts needs. And I would recommend that we perhaps like survey the schools and like the students and the staff to see like what are perhaps focus points that we could um, go in like understanding and communicate to this group if they come in so that they at least we have an understanding of what we might need even before they come in because I think that would just better like our course of action overall. Um, Kristen and then Leanne. I think, I don't even know if I'm in agreement with what people are saying, but I think that this intake meeting that Diane was talking about almost needs to be just Sandy and Diane and Monique or with board members there if we want to hear what their, what their services are and what we might need. And if all we can say at that point is we now, our very first thing we want to do is get feedback from the various stakeholders mm -hmm. to see what our next step is, but I still feel like that first meeting needs to just be really basic about what services there are, just sort of where we're They've at. already had that meeting. And that's a meeting that Diane's already had though. So we would have to, at the next meeting, say, here's everything we want. We can't start by saying, we'd like to survey the community, we'd like to get some data first. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, again, as we talk about surveying the community and finding out, um, you know, listening to the community about what they think their needs are, that is part of the scope of work that we could engage them in. Yeah, I guess that's all I'm saying is I think that we need to say that, say we want to do a survey before we determine what our other needs are. I don't, I guess I just am a little concerned about just diving into, I don't know, trying to determine that all in a workshop. If we haven't even necessarily signed up for their services. Leanne? Okay. Um, I'm in between a little bit with Sarah Max and with Kristen. I think it sounds as though if we could do that climate survey to get a, a pulse of where we are from the district, from student staff, the community, that would lay the foundation for them to come in and say, this is what we've heard and this is what we are recommending of our services and why. And then from there, we would be able to start creating, here's what we're gonna do next. Is it gonna be a forum? Are we going to be able to um, do focus groups instead? finding out how they would recommend that we resolve what the climate is. I'm just concerned that if we opened it up on day one, we are gonna to need to facilitate that ourselves because we won't have an agreement with them because we don't know what they're offering, so they're not gonna facilitate for us. I think we're, we could wind ourselves up into a hole, is my concern. Yeah. And I wanna do it right. Alicia? I, I think that time is of the essence. Um, We've made a commitment to the community that we will um, schedule this workshop tonight. And it sounds like there's a potential of that being deferred necessarily, but um, I'm concerned about uh, delaying this and trying to, because we are so cautious in trying to do it right. And I think that we need to really strike a balance. My, my preference would be to invite them in as soon as we can to a workshop invite the community community members to come. There could be a public comment, but not as participants, but there will be a, I, I, I mean, I would view it as just sort of a vetting process that they can uh, um, provide the services that we need. And we know that what we need is some sort of community forum at the very least, which is what we have committed to. Mm -hmm. And then we can expand our scope of work after we d start to develop that action plan. I think we've already heard from them that they can provide that to us. I, I fully um, agree with you all that we need that community feedback and need a survey. Um, I don't know that we need it to choose who we're gonna use. And if we find after we get um, a survey that 
they're not able to provide us with all of that we need, I think then we can have that discussion and, and find out. But we know at the very least that they seem very competent to provide us with the community forum. Um, I think they could probably help us. It's important that the survey is done right too. And so, so I, I would love to see it go proceed in that, in that fashion and then follow up if we need to. Can I clarify one thing? Yeah. Um, my request on the survey was not um, whether or not we did them, but what are their services? It was, I agree with you. I think that everything that I've seen about them, um, because I did check a little bit online, they seem amazing. And the person that we have, highly credentialed. Um, it sounds like an amazing fit. Uh, I'm excited. I just, I want to know what they can bring us. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry, I just, I just want to clarify, and I, I guess I can get on board with, with Alicia's approach just to move this forward. I think the one thing maybe, I, maybe Diane, you can ask them is maybe we can do two things in parallel because what I want to prevent is a, a session where they just come in and, again, just tell us the, their general services. What I want to hear is how they can help us specifically. And so if there's information that we can provide to them, either by, you know, getting um, more, in, some initial feedback prior to that intake meeting, Diane, from the board, from different commun uh, community members, different groups within the district, then I'm, all, I'm on board. But like the presentation I envision for this meeting is them coming in and saying, you told us this, here is our proposal for, for you, Scarborough, and not just sort of a pamphlet of their services, which we can find online. I agree. Is Alicia, is that what you envisioned as well? Yes. Very well articulated. Okay. So I think that we're on the same page. I don't know if everyone else is, but I think so. <laughs> yeah, you said what I was saying without much more clearly than I could. Thank you. Does anyone else have comments? More. I'd like to say thank you, um, Dan, Sandy, and Monique for the work that you've done, and um, for your Sandy and Monique for your statements tonight. I um, know that this has been a challenging time, and it's been difficult um, for me, for our community. I know for our students and our staff, but um, I think our response here is crucial, and um, I'm I'm hopeful that both of your statements tonight will move us forward in, in that work and um, I look forward to doing it, so thank you. So based on the comments that we've heard and, and the kind of um, consensus that I'm hearing is that we would like to provide um, this group with some initial information or data um, before they come and just give us a, a blanket presentation of their services. So then the question becomes, what, what data are we giving them and where is that coming from? <laughs> and, who's, and whose work is that? And I'm looking at you guys. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, the, um, maybe Sandy, Diane, Monique, a school board member, if, if a board member wants to attend, and maybe somebody from the civil rights team or or the um, anti-racism coalition could could just sort of have that conversation and provide some input and just to, for you're saying to seek the information for the presentation. That that might be just a sh small group. Okay, Nick. I don't know, put the, to turn the whole thing around, one of the questions, I, as I've been listening, I've been thinking to myself, how do we let them know exactly what we're looking for? Because we're, we're kind of thinking, we want them to tell us what their services are, but then on the other side of the fence, what exactly are we hoping that they'll be able to help us to facilitate to do? What are, what are our goals um, for this event and then like subsequent growth afterward? That's kind of what I'm wondering, because I know, I mean, obviously I know the general message of what we're doing with this workshop, and I think it's very important, but I'm imagining if this company is as good as they appear to be, and I've also been snooping on my computer as we've been talking, um, they're going to ask us, what are you looking for? Kristen? 
that's exactly the point that we made, which is why we have to sort of refine that before I think we go to them. But I don't think it needs to be perfect, right? I think we just need more, a little bit more information. But I agree with Alicia. Uh, you know, bring in Sandy Diane, bring in a couple other people, have that conversation, and then have the intake meeting. Kristen? Yeah, I think I'm in agreement, and I guess I am not doing a very good job articulating, but I, I guess my thought on it is these people are Is she frozen for you guys, too? She is. Yes. Yeah, she frozen for y'all? Okay. Oh, you're back. Kristen, <laughs> Kristen, you were frozen there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even know how far I got, but I guess I was, I'm, I'm wondering if these people, being the experts that they are, if they won't be able to help us set those goals. I guess my concern going to them saying here are our goals, are we jumping the gun where they might say, you know, here's what's been effective for districts when they're trying to establish what they want to do. Like, I guess I wonder if we go in with too much specifics, they might say, they might have feedback that might alter what our approach is. That's all. But I know what you guys are saying. We want it to be specific to Scarborough. And I agree with that. But I just think that we need to factor in what these trained professionals can tell us, even with goal setting. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Diane? The only other thing that I would just add is that, um, again, I, I think that is um, one of the clear messages that I got from our meeting was that they really value that stakeholder feedback and so really couldn't underscore enough the value of um, the listening tours, um, collecting that information because we've got to find out where everybody really does sit and what the issues are um, before we can then identify a course of action. I know that this is a topic that everyone is interested in pursuing. Do I have a volunteer um, who will participate on an initial call with um, administration and, and some individuals who can get this process started? I'm happy to volunteer. Okay, Shannon has volunteered. Thank you, Shannon. So I know that it had been our goal tonight to set a date for a workshop. Um, I think we've had some really great conversation and laid the groundwork um, for at least setting us in the direction that we need to be headed. Um, so I think for now, I'm comfortable that we aren't setting a hard, fast um, timeline and that we really need to allow these initial conversations to happen before we can decide on, on the next step. Is everyone, is that the consensus? Sarah. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I guess my, my only suggestion would be maybe we work on some sort of statement uh, of an update just because it was on our agenda tonight to set a workshop date. Um, and knowing that not that many people are on this meeting right now, uh, I'm wondering if we could put together a statement that just says what our next steps are. And I'm happy to work on that with somebody to April. Um, thank you, Sarah. I think that that's a valuable suggestion. We don't have committees, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, and so right now, we don't necessarily have someone who would naturally take the lead on that. So if you are willing to draft something, um, we can put that into a Google Doc, and I would be happy to collaborate with that on if that feels good for everyone. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. If everyone's comfortable with that, I can do that tomorrow. Okay. 
with no other comments or conversation, I'm going to go ahead and move on to agenda item 8.0, which is committee reports. Do we have a share screen? Do we have a share screen? Okay. Okay. So there's no slide, which is, which is expected because we don't have committees right now. <laughs> so um, the, one of my first requests of you is to please reach out to me um, individually with your um, preferences for upcoming committees. I can um, send each member of the board a list of our standing committees as well as our liaison roles. Um, so that everyone has the same set of information um, and you can email me and I'll, I'll, I'll draft up something with a deadline on it um, so that I can have committee assignments prepared for our next meeting. Nick, I see your hand. Um, not to, not to, to throw a wrench into it, but um, I actually did create a slide for a negotiations update. <laughs> should be there somewhere because um, negotiations has been continuing since Hillary's departure. Um, where is it? I swear to God I created it. <laughs> well, I can read it off my machine. Um, give me one moment here. Da, da, da. What the heck is it? So I just wanted to give a brief update on where we are with the MOU discussions. Um, is it up now? No, is it still blank? Can anyone hear me? That's so strange because it's up on my screen, but on your screen it's blank. That's really weird, but um, I'll read through it. So um, with Hillary's departure, Hillary was the chair of negotiations. Sarah and I have continued the work that she started related to the uh, MOUs um, for memorandums of understanding for COVID-19. Um, there are tentative agreements signed for all four of the SEA CBAs. Um, and so for everyone that doesn't, anyone that's listening that doesn't know that, although looking at the list, I think you all probably do. Uh, we have teachers and professional staff. We have our educational support staff, also known as ed techs. Um, we have our uh, custodians and then we have our food service and bus drivers and then food service and custodians are together. So those four groups um, did sign TAs. The board actually ratified those TAs on Monday at a special meeting. Uh, and now it's in the SEA's hands and their membership to vote. If they haven't voted already, they're doing it very, very soon because these had to be fast tracked due to the fact that some of the things that were agreed to in there do connect with the COVID relief funding. And so we were able to make use of that funding. Um, and But in order to do that, the timeline was tight to get it, at the, get it into the federal government so that we don't lose those funds. So those are in the works. Um, since the discussions on those particular MOUs has essentially come to a close, we did reach out to the two remaining groups, uh, the SPS administrators, as well as the maintenance staff. They're both, uh, they both collectively bargain, but they're not um, represented by the Scarborough Education Association or the MEA. So we actually reached out to them separately with MOUs that had similar language that was pertinent to their collective bargaining agreements. Um, today, I had a Zoom meeting with the SPS administrators that was very productive. Um, we're, hope, we're confident that we'll be able to wrap um, up those discussions next week. Uh, and then I've also sent out uh, a copy of a draft to the maintenance staff. And um, the maintenance staff uh, got back to me. They're going to look at it and let me know if they have any questions. Um, those two groups are relative groups are relatively small compared to the others, and so I'm confident in something for the board very soon. But I wanted you all to know that those discussions were still ongoing, and with the idea that we want everybody to have some accommodation in their agreements um, with the realities of COVID still with us for the foreseeable future. Right. Thank you, Nick. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to give a brief liaison update, which is um, related to my serving as the delegate at the MSBA uh, school board conference this past weekend. Um, I do not regret volunteering. It is still one of my favorite things to do. It was five and a half hours long. <laughs> there was so much parliamentary procedure <laughs> that we got quite tangled, um, and it's it's 
you know, it is what it is to try and have uh, 80 people in the room making motions and making amendments and trying to, we had people trying to move the question and that halted discussion. And of course, it's all virtual. Um, and so it's always a learning experience to participate in that. Um, there were four resolutions that were being proposed this year. Uh, very briefly, the first resolution was the development of a distance learning plan. That, motion, that resolution passed with minor um, amendments, and I can provide the um, final copies to everyone um, after the meeting. The MSBA resolution number two was to build strong family support for education. Um, that resolution also passed with minor edits. Um, some really great discussion around that one. Uh, similar to what we had discussed as a board, um, and ultimately that did pass. Equity in education is the third resolution. Um, that is the resolution that we had the quite lengthy amendment that we wanted to make um, as a board, and it was at 7.45 at night. We had been doing this a very long time, and I'm not going to lie, my heart was pounding knowing that I was about to drop this huge amendment on everyone's lap. But I did it, and it was so well received. So kudos to the board who helped um, develop the wording. I had people messaging me the following day saying how proud they were of the wording. That being said, it failed. Uh, the amendment requires a two-thirds majority, um, and people expressed concerns that I would have had from the outside looking in, which was because of the length and, and whether, whether or not the amendment changed the resolution too much from what people had already decided that they were going to vote yes or no on. And that's a concern when you're a delegate, no matter what. That being said, even people who said, I'm not going to be able to vote yes on this, I love this. Um, and so ultimately what was decided, um, the chair of the MSBA reached out to me and asked me if she could include the wording that we had written um, in the description that will now accompany the resolution. So excellent job, excellent work um, to our board on that. Um, and then the fourth and final resolution was um, school board meeting re remote present, uh, participation, which also passed. You're welcome. Thanks, April, for doing that. You guys, it's, it's so fun. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no other liaison reports or committee reports, we will move on to agenda item 9.0, student representative reports. Alrighty, it's my time. Hello, everyone. Um, super excited to be doing this again. I did one recently, but this one's a little bit longer. Um, first off, I want to give a big warm welcome to Gabby Giftos. Um, she was just recently elected as the junior representative for the school board, and I couldn't be prouder or more happy. Um, she's not going to be at all involved in the report tonight. I didn't want to stress her out for her first meeting, but, um, since, you know, I'm remote and she's like the only one there, but, um, I just want to congratulate her. I know she's going to do a really great job and I'm not supposed to say this, but she kind of won the landslide. So like do with that what you will. Um, we're going to move on from that point. Okay. So if you could go on to the next slide, that would be lovely. All right, this has a lot of stuff on it, but this is about Wentworth. Um, Wentworth recently did its iReady diagnostic tests, and this assesses uh, students' skills and comprehension with reading and writing, and um, it's basically just like a standardized test for um, younger kids. And my sister's a third grader at Wentworth, and let me tell you, she was not a happy camper when she had to do this, but um, that's aside from the point, it's important overall. Um, there were also parent-teacher conferences this past week, and that's great. Um, also, I was reading through the update, the newsletter on S'more, which I found out was a thing this morning when I was uh, reading through how like the um, schools communicate their newsletters, um, and it's a great place. And I was reading through on what Wentworth had to say, and I was reading about their uh, cultural competence, uh, competency institute work and how they're recognizing like differences in race, class, gender, political affiliation, sexual orientation, age, 
religion, ability, or any other kind of identity. And I think that that work is super important in our district. And I'm really glad to see this happening at like a younger level. I think that like what happens in, I guess you could say your more primitive or developmental years is super important to your identity and how you um, communicate and articulate yourself going forward. So I'm really glad to see that happening at Wentworth. All right, so that's everything for this slide. So this is about middle school sports. Uh, fortunately, they were all able to have shortened seasons for boys and girls soccer, field hockey, and cross country. And as you can see from these photos, COVID-19 safety protocols were all followed, thank goodness. There was social distancing and mask wearing, except when students are doing, are doing uh, strenuous activity, they don't have to wear masks, but it's all very safe. Um, you know, students look really happy great to get students back to their act activities. So. That's great. All right, that's everything for this slide. So this past week at the high school, or maybe it was last week, I can't remember, but um, it was Spirit Week, the student council hosted. We normally have Spirit Week, the week coming up to homecoming, but obviously we didn't have coming, homecoming this year because of like the pandemic and everything. But we had our own little, um, our own little spirit week uh where like there were two days and cohort a did it monday tuesday cohort b did it tuesday or thursday friday uh monday and thursday were uh pj day and tuesday and friday were costume day and as you can see there were some very fun and creative costumes you can see max keller in the banana suit and maggie ammon in the dinosaur costume so that's really fun that's everything for this slide and this is my final slide. And I just wanted to touch on the students in the Anti-Racism Coalition and the Civil Rights Club and how they held a protest outside of the municipal building in support of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I'm a part of the group. We're all super grateful for the media attention we received. We had articles about us in CNN, the Boston Globe, uh, Portland Press Herald, tons of other things. There was an article in the leader today. Um, we're super grateful for the district's response. I was really glad to hear what uh, Mrs. Culbertson and Mr. Prince said earlier tonight. Um, I'm really looking forward to the work we have ahead of us. I think it's going to be super important and um, really awesome for that to happen in our district. And overall, I'm just really proud of the work that um, all of my fellow students have been doing during this time period. It's super important and I couldn't be happier that it's happening in our district. So yeah, that's everything. Excellent, thank you, Max, and welcome again, Gabby. Agenda item 10.0 is new business. I will be um, combining 10.1, 10.2, and 10.3. The meeting minutes for September 3rd, 2020, the meeting minutes for September 17th, 2020, and the meeting minutes for October 1st, 2020. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Diane? Uh, discussion? Okay, Diane, call the vote, please. Mrs. Giptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giptos? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Agenda item 10.5 is the first reading of policy ACAA, harassment and sexual harassment of students. And I'm gonna turn the discussion over to our um, policy chair, Alicia, to give us some information on, on what this first reading is. Okay, so um, in policy, in the policy committee we've been um, working on policies that need to be updated by uh, and prioritizing those but with um, the, those policies that have been implicated by changes of law. And um, Jemin Woodsum advises the school district as it relates to these policies and they provide us with an update um, and they do that. They have a statewide practice representing school boards and school systems. And so they, they present these um, proposed changes statewide and we've been going through them um, individually in, in the um, policy committee. ACAA re uh, relates to harassment and sexual harassment of students. 
Um, these have all been provided as part of our um, supporting documents for the agenda. Um, they, the policies are, are um, split up so that the harassment and sexual harassment um, complaints and um, handling of complaints um, are different under Title IX for um, sexual harassment. And then there's a, a separate um, protocol for harassment related to race, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, ancestry, or national origin or disability. Um, so we've had, um, uh, we've, there's a more formal process that's been established in the Title IX um, sexual harassment arena. Diane has taken a training um, about, about that Title IX process, um, the trainings required for the school system, and how many days was it? Um, it was over four days, so um, it was four half-day trainings. Thank you. Uh, so um, ACAA and um, sort of defines the, the harassment in Title IX um, sexual harassment, and then the, the R is the procedures, the accompanying procedures. In it, you'll note that we've identified the affirmative action officer for the district, who's Chris Rohde, and um, we've identified uh, Dr. Nato as the Title IX coordinator for these um, complaints. Then we have um, ACAB and ACABR again. Um, these relate to um, harassment and sexual harassment of school employees, as, uh, as I indicated before, ACAA is as it relates to students. Um, ACAB is more of the defining document. ACABR is the procedural policy. Um, we did have some, um, I think I discussed this a little bit in our, um, in my prior policy committee update. We did have some um, individualization we were, were interested in, in policy uh, um, for, for uh, and making changes to some of these policies trying to uh, consider how potential victims would feel and, and what that process would be like if as a, as a victim um, when, they were, when they're making their statements and, and going through the complaint uh, policy and how overwhelming that must be. Um, so we did um, meet about that, discussed it, um, met with the attorneys and um, tried to incorporate some of those suggestions um, when it was not a liability. Um, and we felt that we were able to do that with all except for one, and I'll just point that out under both ACAB and um, R and ACAAR, uh, there was a potential option of having the appellate procedure go um, to the to the superintendent, and then the the, um, the law firm indicated that the boards could have a conversation about potentially then having a second tier of appellate procedure that would allow an appeal to then go to um, the school board. An appeal would only be permissible um, if there was some sort of an error, or I think um, the other qualifying factor was new information. So. An appeal in general would be limited to very specific circumstances and um, have to fall under those qualifying factors. And as it stands now, it would be appealed to the superintendent. We did have a discussion. We were interested in um, pursuing the second layer of um, appellate practice just because we felt like you know, due process is, is really important. And no matter if you're the alleged perpetrator or victim, we felt that it was um, important to sort of have an, an outside body to um, be able to turn to. Um, however, ultimately, it's not our recommendation to include that in the policy. We did talk to two sets of lawyers about that, and, and that's because um, there's a potential that the board could ultimately then become um, 
what what I call the sentencing body, it, 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 the viewed um, uh, being used as um, the governing body for an expulsion hearing. So if the board was um, to serve in a role as an appellate body first and then have to preside over um, an expulsion hearing, the board would, would have already heard information and made decisions and um, been a part of the decision-making process and then to be part of the expulsion process um, could be a problem. We, we agreed with the attorneys with, with that analysis. Um, another potential uh, complicating implication is that during the decision-making phase, the board might be privy to information or evidence that it wouldn't have um, at its disposal at an expulsion hearing. And um, would that potentially exclude the board from being um, the governing body for the expulsion hearing? So we just, although we took it very seriously, we believe firmly in due process. We want to do the best that we can. Um, we take these complaints and this policy very seriously, obviously. Um, but ultimately in weighing um, the, the potential uh, implications, we felt that it was not recommended to have that second tier of, um, of appellate uh, process to the, to the board. And those, that was the rationale of the group at, at, at the policy level. Um, we did review the hazing policy. There, I don't believe there were any real. Alicia, can I? Can we bundle the first? Yes. All of the Sorry. ACAA policies, yes. and then we'll move on. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I propose um, that we. I, well, I'm going to bundle um, first reading of policy ACAA, first reading of policy ACAAR, first reading of policy ACAB, first reading of policy ACABR and first reading of policy ACAD. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. And now um, discussion. So anyone who would like to speak to any of those policies is welcome to do so. Kristen? Yeah, I'll start by saying thank you because I know that these are important policies and had to be difficult to work on um, and think about all of them. But I just had one tiny question and it might be in more than one, but I'm on page page 10 on ACAA-R and just the way it's worded, it says, um, if the complainant is a minor, their parent or legal guardian shall also be allowed to participate in the informal resolution. If we have a student who's 18, are they also entitled to have their parent? So um, it's funny that that's what, what you're asking about because um, a lot of the debate we had was around the informal resolution process and um, the, the concern I think was how the informal resolution process might be intimidating to somebody who is making a complaint of harassment or bullying. And um, again, I know from speaking for myself, I tried to um, think about what that process would be like if I were the person in that situation and making that complaint and, and what I would may need to be successful and advocate for myself. And so um, I was concerned that that process could be overwhelming to somebody who was potentially a victim of, of um, any of that harassment or discrimination and, and um, intimidating and, and confusing. And so we did um, actually, Kristen, add language into the um, policy that was not necessarily recommended initially um, that just, and, and really, and maybe semantics, but for us, it felt like the right thing to do that reiterates that um, you have the right to an attorney or a representative to accompany you to the informal resolution process and that the informal resolution process is voluntary. And we did that really just sort of for that reason, thinking of um, individuals that might feel vulnerable during that 
that um, informal resolution process and and um, just try to put it in black and white so that they could um, understand that they have a right to support and that they can't be forced to dismiss their complaint unless if it's something that they feel comfortable with. And so we hope that that additional language is something that guides us sort of in spirit and in practice and also assists anybody that is um, needs to take advantage of that provision of the policy. I, I completely appreciate the language that's in there. I guess my only question is I want to make sure that a student just because they're 18 doesn't forfeit the right to have a parent with them should they choose to have one. No, we added we added language that it, okay. that um, specifically identifies that any any person can bring um, an advisor or or support person. Sarah. I just wanted to echo Kristen's thanks. Um, it sounds like you guys have put a lot of thought into this um, and didn't just sort of accept the initial recommendations and, and challenge them. And so I appreciate that and all your time. Um, I would also just say like, this was an emotionally heavy lift. Mm -hmm. Policy was not easy to to sit through for hours and hours and hours. Um, and I just want to express my gratitude to Leanne and Diane and Sandy and Alicia for uh, engaging in those conversations. Um, so thank you for that. With that, um, Diane, I think we're ready to vote. Great. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yep. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Skiftos? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item 10.10, .10, first reading of policy JLF, which I'm also going to bundle with 10.11, first reading of policy JLFE. But before we have a motion, I will let um, Alicia speak to those. Um, thank you. So, again, this was um, a policy that was recommended to be uh, reformed. Alicia, do you mind having your mic on? Oh, sorry. Thank you. This was a policy that was recommended to be reformed uh, due to a statutory change. Um, the uh, individuals who work for Scarborough Schools and anybody that works for a school system are are mandated reporters to, um, they're required to report suspected child abuse or neglect. This policy um, talks about that. It's, it's interesting because um, the individual has a responsibility to report the child abuse and neglect and then the school system has the responsibility as well to ensure that that report's made in a timely fashion. Um, sometimes it's, required to be made to the um, Department of Health and Human Services. Sometimes it's required to be made to um, uh, the district attorney's office as well or to law enforcement. So um, this process outlines what abuse or neglect is. Um, there were some changes in those definitions. We've included those changes um, in this policy. It outlines how um, a report is to be made we were, um, uh, we were m in making sure that um, employees knew that they had the right to make uh, the report in, as an individual, uh, whether the school system made the report on their behalf or not, and that the employee also has a responsibility to ensure that if they are deferring that judgment to the school system, that the school system does, in fact, make the report. Um, so... Uh, it out, this policy outlines how that's going to occur. It also talks about um, internal investigations and discipline if um, the, the abuse or neglect is related um, somehow to employment or school activities. Uh, the policy also talks about, at times, um, 
the Department of Health and Human Services Child Protective Division needs to interview children. Um, sort of this policy lays out the, um, the parameters for those interviews to occur safely for children um, and um, requires the administration to cooperate in that investigation. And then um, there are a couple of uh, pretty substantial changes that there's um, child abuse awareness and prevention training for school employees. And then this was, um, I mean, this is what I do for work, so it wasn't um, as difficult for me, but I know that I, for others this was a really difficult topic, and I think it could be something that's challenging for um some of our parents to hear there is a requirement now that child sexual abuse prevention education occurs um, for students and um, that is going to be implemented in our schools and um, we did have a discussion with Monique the director of curriculum about that and how that is going to occur um, it's going to occur in really sort of uh, age-appropriate discussions in education and I think Diane used some examples of um, skits or, or plays and, and really um, just being able to have those conversations with children in, in um, language that they understand and that's appropriate for them. The supporting um, JLF E is just the form that we are going to approve hopefully for the um, schools to use um, when they are mandated, mandated to make a report of suspected child abuse or neglect. It's um, more detailed than the previous form was. We, we think that that's a good thing. Um, and thank you to Kelly and Diane for including the little person on there. <laughs> that's, I think, going to be helpful detail. So the recommendation of the policy committee is to approve um, those two policies as well. Excellent. Um, so first reading of policy JLL, JLF and first reading of policy JLFE. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Okay, seeing none, um, Diane, I believe we're ready to vote. Great. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftos? Yes. Excellent. Agenda item 10.12 is appointments. Okay, so I'd like to. Uh recommend a high school special ed teacher one-year position. Jeannie Ells has been selected to fill this position created by a resignation. She, she received a BS degree in communications from US, USM as well as her master's degrees in education and special ed. She's been a special education technician three for the past 13 years at the high school with the last three in the academic life skills classroom where she will now resume the teaching position. She'll be placed on step one of the bachelor's scale per collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Jeannie Ells as a high school special ed teacher one-year position. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Thank you. Any discussion? Okay. Diane, I believe we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftos? Yes. 10.12.2, middle school foreign language teacher Jean Geslin has been chosen to fill this position created by a reassignment. Mr. Geslin earned both his undergraduate degree and his graduate degree in chemistry from the National Graduate School of Chemistry in Paris, France. He is currently enrolled in the Masters of Arts in Teaching Program at the University of Maine. He has been a project engineer, a project manager, 
a radioactive materials inspector, and most recently a health physicist before making a career change to teach him. Mr. Gesselin will be placed on step one of the master's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Gene Gesselin as a middle school foreign language teacher. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? Okay, Diane. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftos? Yes. Very good, thank you. Agenda item 11.0 is adjournment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Diane. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftos? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Oh, gosh. How do I leave the meeting? Okay, here we go.